Hello, everyone. I am Dr. Marina Bassina, and I'm Clinical Professor of Medicine at Stanford University Division of Endocrinology. And I welcome you all here for our mini diabetes um, lectures on uh, various diabetes topics uh, devoted to World Diabetes Day. My um, topic for this talk is how to help you to interpret your own continuous glucose monitoring data in between the visits uh, to the doctors, to your healthcare providers. We are seeing you in clinic only once every three to four months or less frequently than that. Um, and it will be very helpful if you can look at your own data and make your own treatment decisions uh, based on the information that I will try to provide you today. Uh, so continuous glucose monitoring devices uh, give us uh, blood sugar readings every one to five minutes, depending on the device. The data could be overwhelming because you will see 288 readings per day, over 2,000 readings per week, over 4,000 readings per 14 days, and over 8,500 readings per month. How to use this data, how to make sense of it, and not to get overwhelmed with this data. I um, used this table here just to show you what are currently available continuous glucose monitoring devices on the market. And I will quickly go over um, each one, um, not in detail, but just briefly. So Dexcom G6 is um, available currently for the past several years. Uh, it requires no calibration. But if you want to calibrate it, if the data is may not be accurate comparing to the finger sticks, you can calibrate it. The warm up period in two hours, which means that when you place the device for the first two hours, you are not seeing the data. It lasts for 10 days. It has customizable alerts and alarm. It can be integrated with the insulin pump and you can share the data with up to 10 people on the Dexcom follow application on the phone. It is water resistance for eight feet up to 24 hours. Libre 2 and Libre 3 are similar. The difference is with the size and also with um, the flash uh, sensor as a Libre 2 versus real-time sensor, which is the Libre 3. So both do not need to be calibrated and not uh, there's no uh, option to calibrate. The warm up period is one hour. They're worn for 14 days. They both have customizable alerts and alarms. They are not integrated currently with any of the insulin pumps. Um, their data sharing can be up to 20 people with the Librate Link app, phone app. And the water resistance, three feet for 30 minutes. Guardian 3 or Metronic continuous glucose monitoring device does require calibration twice a day. The warm up period is two hours. <clears throat> the duration of use seven days. They are alerts and alarms. It is integrated with Metronic pump and the data is shareable with up to four people via Caroline Connect application and it can be submerged um, to 7.5 feet for up to 10 minutes. And the Eversense is the implantable continuous glucose monitoring device that does require calibration. Um, the warm up is 24 hours. The duration of use, six months. They are alerts and alarms. So far, no integration with the pump and it can be shared, the data can be shared with up to five people with Eversense Now app on the phone. It can be water resistant up to three feet for 30 minutes. Um, this is a busy slide, but what I wanted to show on this slide, mainly if you look at this left column, when you look at your device, whichever continuous glucose monitoring device you're wearing, the important uh, information is not to just what the blood sugar is currently, but if it's rising or falling or if it's staying steady. So if you look at those arrows on the left column, each arrow or each sign would represent how fast or how slow blood sugars are changing. 
And that is important to look at because it will show you not only where you are now, uh, but where are you are going? It's a forecasting where you are going in the next 30 to 60 minutes. On different devices, there are different number of arrows and different direction of arrows. But in general, if you see one arrow up, it's about two milligram per deciliter per minute going up, which means that anticipated change, for example, in 30 minutes would be about 60 points higher. Um, if the blood sugars are, uh, if this arrow pointing down, it would be the same uh, magnitude, but um, going down with the blood sugar. And if the number of arrows increasing, so the blood sugars are either fast rising or fast falling. So those would be important um, to look at and uh, follow those arrows on those devices. How do you prepare yourself for a continuous glucose monitoring device? So for those of you who are wearing it now, or for those of you who are not wearing it now, it's just to preparing yourself to start on the device. It's one is important um, point is to realize what is the reality of glycemic control. That when you're seeing your data and you are seeing so much of the data, you may see more than sometimes you want to, um, to see on this, those devices. And uh, at the start, you may expect to see glucose only 50% within target range or less because some of the data that you were not checking with the finger stick would, was not available to you. And now you're seeing a lot more information. How to utilize this data? So the data can be utilized as real-time data, looking at your current screen with the arrows. It can be utilized for looking at the effect of the insulin or other medications. It can be utilized for pattern recognition when you do your retrospective analysis, and we'll go through that. And it's important to set your own target. Um, usual recommended target would be before meal from blood sugar from 80 to 130, and post meal for, uh, from 180, from 140 to 180. So when we look at the real time data, so again, we're looking at what the blood sugar is currently and where, where, what is the direction it is headed. It is useful to wear those devices when we look at them. So if uh, we wear the devices but not pay attention to them, uh, we don't get much information. But um, if we look at those devices and the, the studies have been shown that um, individuals who look at the devices 10 to 12 times per day um, have more of the actionable um, information uh, and are looking at those patterns on the continues on the CGM. Um, use the ability to forecast where your numbers are going in the next 30 to 60 minutes. When is the good time to the look at the monitor? Always at that time. Um, if your blood sugar is going up or down or staying steady before you go to sleep. It's always useful to look before meals. It's always useful to look after meals to see, especially in the real time, how different foods affecting your blood sugar. If you feel weird, if you feel strange and not clear what's causing it, so it's useful to look at your monitor. And if your device is alerting or if you have a dog that is alerting you, so that would be useful to look at those too. How do we understand the data? Uh, we always need to keep in mind that there is a lag time between what's showing on the sensor and what we measure with the finger stick. The reason is that on the finger stick, we check the blood glucose. On the continuous glucose monitoring device, we check the interstitial fluid glucose. So there is a lag time between interstitial fluid and the blood glucose, plus adding to that electromechanical sensor delay. All of that delays the reading for about 10 to 15 minutes on an average. Um, and due to the time for this reaction takes and delays in the signal processing that may be used also to smooth the data. So again, it's important to know that what we're seeing now, it's with some sort of the delay. What are the keys for success? Um, the keys for success would be to, change, to check your trans lines often, to work with lag times, knowing that there is a food lag, insulin lag, sensor lag. So all of that needs to be taken into account. 
the food absorption, the insulin absorption, the lag time of the sensor showing the data, not being afraid to experiment and not expecting to be a perfectionist. So if we look at some of the examples, uh, what, how we can review the retrospectively um, our CGM information. So first we can look at the pattern recognition. And sometimes you would look at it and there would be no pattern like uh, the picture above that I showed you. So the numbers are kind of all over the place. So it's hard to say whether there's any pattern. But on the other hand, on a picture below, you can see clear pattern with the high nocturnal blood sugars overnight, then coming down, and then again, uh, going up during the day. So we see more complete picture for comprehensive review and, and making solutions. We can use that for basal rate testing or for basal insulin testing, for evaluation of postprandial spikes, to look at the nighttime patterns, to determine and adjust total daily dose, and many, many more. So when do you and how do you plan reviewing your data? It's very useful to keep records for one to two weeks before you re retrospectively review your upload. Um, you can make some notes uh, of timing and content of certain meals that you want to review and maybe repeat this particular meal two to three times during this one to two weeks. Uh, if you're looking at your exercise patterns, note in your, uh, put in your note duration and nature of the exercise. Insulin doses if you're using multiple daily injections. Um, and some noteworthy events, eating out, illness, stress, or menstrual periods. And you can also use it for basal rate testing. And um, this table gives you some recommendations on how to perform the basal testing. Uh, for example, if you want to do the overnight basal test, you eat your last meal by 6 p.m and you have no caloric uh, boluses or exercise until 7 a.m. and no nighttime snacks, and you evaluate data from 10 p.m. to 7 a.m. on your continuous glucose monitoring device. Um, so you can identify patterns and combine it with the insulin data. That would be the most uh, useful information that you can uh, get from the devices. For example, on this upper graph, you can clearly see that the pattern is of low blood sugars in the evenings. So first would be to stop the lows and then uh, taking care of the highs. On the graph below, you can clearly see that low blood sugars are overnight. And then uh, you can see the post-meal spiking blood sugars and then subsequently overcorrection of those spikes and going low again. So this, this is a useful information that we get from looking at the retrospective several, like a week worth of the data. How not to get overwhelmed. Um, this uh, picture is taken from Diet Tribe um, and looking at 42 factors that can affect blood sugar. So it can be food and uh, different biological factors, specifically scar tissue formation. Um, intramuscular delivery of insulin if you're using the larger needle, some allergies or other uh, factors, the medication use of which insulin or steroid administration or anything else um, that is added to your medication list, activity levels, the exercise, um, the environmental factors, it could be expired insulin, could be inaccurate blood sugar reading, it could be outside temperature affecting your insulin. And behavioral and decision-making, frequency of glucose checks, uh, decision-making biases for the carb counting and um, other social factors. Um, so insulin injection factor is actually one of the most uh, common variable as uh, looking at um, this uh, table or this uh, graph, looking at the scar tissue with lipohypertrophy. So summary of those recommendations, prepare yourself to review the data, choose the right time to do it. No one is perfect, anticipate highs and lows and think positively, review patterns, do not focus on the individual numbers, assess your CGM in conjunction with the insulin or medication data, target low blood sugars or hypoglycemia first. If there is no pattern, start from scratch or contact your provider. If um, it, it is uh, frequently too useful to have someone else, another um, to have a look at the data. Review your total daily dose if you're on insulin. 
what is your percent of the long acting uh, versus the prandial insulin? Correlate that with the carb intake. Make one to two changes at a time. Don't make too many changes at the same time. And then re-review again in a couple of weeks. Be realistic. I have low expectations to start with. Accept that there, there is a learning curve and use situational thinking. What is recently has happened? What is current and what's coming up? Choose what you consider actionable. What can I change? What is worth doing something about? And be patient and enjoy that great control as you can see on this graph. And thank you very much for your attention.